Tuesday, April the 6th. Welcome to the Board of Commissioners Informational Board Briefing. In accordance with the Declaration of Emergency announced on March 11th in 2020 and extended by the Board of County Commissioners on December 17th, today's meeting is being held virtually. I wanna thank everyone for bearing with us through any technical difficulties that may arise throughout our virtual meeting today. Please remember to mute your mic when you are not speaking and before you present, make sure to check that your mic is unmuted and that your camera is on. I ask presenters to remember that the public may be listening via telephone, so please state your name before responding to questions. The first item on our agenda this morning, um, I think this is the first time since I have been on the board of Multnomah County Commissioners that we have been honored to have our Congressman Earl Blumenauer, and I'm going to give him a very short introduction because his career is very long and we could spend the entire two hours this morning just going over his resume, but we will, I will just say a few words. Uh, Earl is a lifelong resident of Portland and he has devoted his entire career to public service. He served in the Oregon legislature, the Multnomah County Commission, and he was on Portland City Council. Throughout his years, Congressman Earl Blumenauer has developed a national reputation for his advocacy of public transportation, land use planning, and environmental protection. Elected to the House of Representatives in 1996, Earl has become a leading advocate for rebuilding and renewing America, and he is currently a member of the Ways and Means Committee, and he chairs the Subcommittee on Trade, and I have known him since I was five years old. And so, Earl Blumenauer, Congressman Blumenauer, my congressman, welcome to Multnomah County. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's uh, perplexing if we haven't uh, been before the county commission during your tenure. That makes me feel bad because I am deeply committed to the county, as you referenced. I'm a, a member of the Alumni Association, uh, and I am particularly proud of the representation that this particular county commission has provided during some of the most challenging of times. You are painfully aware that the county is often the government of last resort. Uh, it's the most important government that most people don't know very much about. Uh, it has a broad sweep, a large workforce, well-trained and dedicated, um, and have been on the front lines of struggling with the effects of this pandemic, uh, where it is visited on the, some of our most vulnerable populations. Um, and I deeply appreciate your efforts uh, with uh, struggling with limited resources to try and provide the most benefits uh, to our, our mutual constituents. Uh, I am honored to represent all uh, Multnomah County residents. I wanted to just take a moment uh, to discuss with you where I think we're going uh, with new congressional action. You saw uh, the $1.9 trillion that the new Congress and the new administration advanced with recovery funding. Um, I could not be more delighted with the range of things that were involved. Uh, this is the first time that we really didn't have to struggle uh, with I want to be polite about the former administration that weren't always our friends uh, and we were uh, often held up uh, with Republicans in in Congress. We didn't have to do that this time because we had an administration that was committed uh, to this bold bill uh, and because of the mechanism we used uh, termed reconciliation, we weren't subject to the potential filibuster in the Senate so we could move forward uh, with anything that we could at least get agreement with the Democrats. Now, bear in mind, this is a very diverse group of Democrats and it's a very narrow margin these days, uh, but nonetheless, the full 1.9 trillion uh, is on its way. We're still awaiting guidance uh, in terms of um, program details, uh, but you have a pretty strong realization of a significant sum of money that's coming your way. Uh, I think it's 157 and a half uh, million dollars. Uh, that's in addition to money that is flowing to the state where they have a fair amount of discretion. That's basically 10% of, of the state's uh, budget. 
um, is coming in additional funding. And then we have uh, for many cities and jurisdictions within Multnomah County getting assistance as well. Uh, one of the things that I'm most excited about is that that's not likely to be the last word. We are at work now. I spent uh, yesterday morning with my colleagues on Ways and Means looking at what the next package could look like because we are dedicated to moving forward with another package, uh, probably with two tranches, one infrastructure, and you may have caught some of the news accounts of what the president announced last week in Pittsburgh. It is truly breathtaking uh, in terms of uh, billions of dollars for things that are long overdue. Uh, 621 billion for transportation infrastructure and resilience. And it's not just modernizing roads and bridges, although that's there, uh, but for safety, for uh, electric vehicle deployment. Um, there's a fund for uh, ambitious projects that are uh, that have regional or national economic significance. And there's a particular element that the president has recommended that uh, warms my heart, and that is $20 billion to, for programs that would reconnect neighborhoods cut off by historic investments and ensure new projects increase opportunity to advance racial equity, environmental justice, and promote affordable access. I don't know about you, but I, I hear uh, Albina Vision written all over uh, that category. Uh, there's a lot there that we will uh, parse and move uh, to try and round out what, what it actually looks like. Uh, 100 billion for public schools, uh, 25 billion for childcare facilities. I mean, the, the range of things uh, is, I use the term breathtaking and I truly believe that to be the case. Uh, just because he's announced it, and even though it looks like we could potentially use the reconciliation process, th there's no guarantee uh, that this will materialize, but we're gonna fight to do so and look forward to working with you to have uh, proposals advanced that could be part of this larger strategy. I want to thank you for work that you have done with resources you've already received. I noted with great interest uh, that you invested in local restaurants. Um, and I, I, that warms my heart. One of the things I'm most proud of in the Recovery Act is that there's $28.6 billion that is dedicated for restaurant recovery uh, we wrote the bill so that there is a set aside for small restaurants that make less than half million dollars in 2019. That is set aside for them, some of the people that are hit the hardest. There is an additional ad advantage uh, where the program in its first days will be reserved for women enterprises, minority veteran owned restaurants so that they'll get a head start rather than PPP where we know that uh, they ended up oftentimes at the end of the line where more uh, well healed uh, were not only at the front of the line but the banks actually wrote their applications and we ended up not getting the money where it de was uh, deserved. Um, I hope that this is something that we can work together on to get the word out because the guidance is likely to happen this month. And even though there's a reservation uh, to help these deserving populations get a head start, uh, there's no guarantee if, if they don't get their act together and apply. It's not unlike what we're doing with the earned income tax credit work on the state level to try and promote utilization of this money that's just lying there that could be made available to low income families. And of course you have experience in terms of the take up rate for food stamps. You've been a, a, a leader in terms of helping people realize what they're entitled to. I hope we can do that going forward with restaurants and other elements. Um, let me just stop at this point. Uh, I'm keenly interested in hearing observations that you may have if there are questions, I'd be willing to try and answer them. 
but I just express my appreciation for you allowing me to uh, crash your party this morning. And I hope that we'll be able to do this in the future as we're working together to make sense out of these programs and meet the needs of our common constituents. Thank you so much, Congressman Blumenauer. Um, I know that the commissioners have questions for you, uh, comments, lobbying they would like to do um, with you this morning. So um, we'll start with uh, Commissioner Myron. Did you have comments or questions for our commissioner, our Congressman? Um, I, I actually just have some comments uh, and uh, mainly an expression of gratitude. Uh, it is so wonderful to, to see you here, um, albeit virtually, but at our board briefing today um, and just hear directly from you because yes, what, what you've said is so, um, so true and uh, we are the front lines um, working hard to implement the policies, um, the, the wonderful policies uh, Finally, that that uh, at the federal level that um, you are pushing for and um, that will benefit our community so much. And I, I just appreciate you and your work and your um, accessibility and just really all that you do. Um, it, it has been a, a tough four years prior to now. Um, and that has been my, my whole experience on this board and in you know, politics, so to speak, uh, but um, just having you there um, gave me inspiration and hope. And uh, and now I'm just glad we're at the other side and look forward to continuing our work together and um, just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's sort of a baptism by fire. <laughs> Commissioner Becky Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you so much, Congressman, for coming today and spending some time with us this morning. And, and um, I just want to thank you so much for all of the work that you've done, um, especially for our restaurants and our um, it's small business owners and restaurants. And getting that included in the package was such a huge important thing. And I know that you were such a leader on that. Um, it, you know, we pride ourselves in Portland on our on our great food scene and restaurants, and to have that hit so hard really hit at the heart of Portland in a lot of ways. So I think that means um, it means so much. Um, I also really appreciate your, just your leadership and your values that you have. And as we're looking at the recovery that we're coming from out of this, to have it truly be an inclusive recovery for all people and really looking at, you know, the things and the systems that are in place that have prevented that from happening before and really using this as an opportunity to make changes there. And I know you'll be advocating for that at every level, including on climate and environmental issues as well. So just appreciate um, all the work that you do around that. I do have one question and it is related to the work that we do um, here at Multnomah County. Um, I, I'm sure you know that the Burnside Bridge project is really Multnomah County's number one infrastructure project. And you know, in the event of a major seismic event, an earthquake ready Burnside Bridge is gonna provide direct immediate access to a lifeline route. And it will also be an opportunity for us to build a safe multimodal bridge to support our, our region and our economy for the next 100 years. I mean, we're talking about a, a bridge that is already almost 100 years old. Um, so as Congress is looking for, to fund infrastructure in this package and future packages, um, and this time you know, with earmarks, um, what are you looking for to prioritize a project for this region? Well, thank you. Uh, and you're right, uh, the stewardship that Multnomah County as for our bridges uh, has been uh, a long, uh, I just, I'll just say it's a challenge. It was a challenge when I was a county commissioner, it continues. Uh, the county has uh, made some significant progress, whether it's uh, a Sobeys Island Bridge or a Selwood Bridge. And I appreciate the work you're doing now for the Burnside Bridge, which is an important lifeline. Um, in the event of major seismic events, uh, we're going to look at probably the interstate freeway bridges uh, collapsing uh, and the county bridges are going to be critical to be able to uh, connect services and people uh, and it's going to take uh, a long time before we return to normal i appreciate the work you're doing on the burnside bridge now 
Um, the earmark process that is um, that may survive reconciliation. It's not clear yet that this process uh, will uh, uh, make it through the Senate. There may be some challenges to it, but the earmarks that we're talking about are on a much smaller scale. Uh, there may be uh, 15 to 20 million dollars that I would be able to direct towards all of my congressional district in uh, Multnomah County and Clackamas County and all the cities and jurisdictions. Uh, so I would probably, not probably, I will be looking at a series of smaller projects that could make a difference in different parts of the region and where a smaller amount of three to seven million dollars might be able to jumpstart something or get something across the finish line. There is a proposal in the president's infrastructure speech that I think needs careful consideration uh, because uh, they are uh, have categories uh, that I'm, I'm mentioned in terms of regional significance, special activities, being able to work with the larger package and work with our delegation, particularly uh, the chair of our transportation and infrastructure committee, Peter DeFazio, there may be an opportunity in that larger package to be able to carve out uh, a, a significant sum of money that would help in your effort. I'm assuming it's going to be uh, between a half billion and a billion dollars. I know there's a, a number in between there, but we know the nature of these uh, um, are a little imprecise. But it's a really big number, and I think the way that we would be able to have something would be with the president's infrastructure package uh, as part of this $600 billion that he's talking about uh, for major uh, infrastructure, roads, bridges, and resilience. And there may be a way to have multiple categories that play in. Thank you so much, Congressman. And Commissioner Sickman. Thank you, Chair. It's great to see you, Congressman. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, first off, I wanted to thank you for all of your efforts. Uh, we, you're probably well aware that we had the opportunity to take some of that CARES funding that you fought so hard for to distribute a million dollars to East County businesses. And 50% of those over 400 businesses were BIPOC and women owned. Uh, so thank you so much. And with the leadership of, of Chair Kafori, we were able to get that money out the door. So I'm really excited to hear more uh, about uh, restaurants getting additional resources because they need it. So thank you so much for that. I also wanted to thank you for your work around the Columbia River Gorge Access Committee. I know that this is still kind of in the works, but I've been working uh, on the Gorge Forum and with folks out here and am really excited to potentially see a committee formed around the access and even more exciting, some potential for some funding uh, to get our jurisdictions to be able to work in a more collaborative manner. I did have one question for you. So in Fairview, uh, we were able to assist the Fairview uh, Food Bank that delivers or people can pick up groceries every Saturday, about 100 households, and we were able to help support them. But as you know, so many people are struggling. And I was just wondering, uh, is there money specific for like the Oregon Food Bank or to address the food insecurity, especially here uh, in East County, because we know that so many people are struggling. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, yes, I'm ac excited about Gorge Access and working with you and your colleagues. Uh, and I do appreciate what you have done earlier to be able to take those scarce resources and be able to target them. As you know, um, I graduated from Centennial High School. I've represented uh, much of the East County area throughout my career in different positions. Um, and there are vast unmet needs and I appreciate your leadership and your commitment. One of the things I would like to do with you in particular is to collaborate on how we get the word out that people be able to take advantage, for example, of this Restaurants Act. The material is going to be available soon, uh, but I mentioned the protections uh, that 
helped um, people of color, women, veterans, uh, but it means they have to be there making the application as soon as possible. And we would really like to be able to work with you uh, to be able to get that work out. Maybe we work together on a uh, on a Zoom call that we can target for people who we can give them more information. We can encourage them to apply. We can be able to make sure the networks work for them. We are involved with the next round beyond infrastructure. Part of it deals with the human infrastructure and there will be efforts uh, to try and provide additional resources there as well. And we'll be in close contact with you. Uh, we'll be in discussion in terms of uh, you know what works best, but clearly the food and nutrition part of the equation, uh, whether we're talking about college students uh, who, uh, you know, Mount Hood Community College, Portland Community College, organizing their own food banks for students that don't have enough food to eat. Um, there, I'm quite confident there will be resources for nutrition. There will be resources for child care facilities and support. Um, helping extend the, the uh, sweep of services you provide. And I'm optimistic that we'll be able to get an additional uh, investment through and give you some flexibility uh, to deal with those vast unmet needs. Thank you so much, Congressman. And I have to give the Portland Business Alliance a plug because they partnered with Multnomah County to get those restaurant grants out the door. So we have already built an infrastructure. So uh, we're, we're happy to work alongside you, uh, just waiting to have access to that, that funding. So, but just wanted you to know that we've already built the infrastructure. So I think that we will be able to expedite very quickly uh, to get those funds out, uh, at least for East County. And I think that the Portland Business Alliance has has developed a really great model that probably could be used countywide. So anyway, I just wanted to thank you so much. I know you're you're an East County guy and always appreciate uh, how you support East County and uplift folks out here. And, and you know the struggles that so many people out here face. So always wanna just thank you for your support. Thank you, Commissioner. And I, I noted with interest uh, how well things worked earlier and I think you're right, we can build on that model. But one of the things we can start doing right now is getting the word out for people to get their information together. The grant, these are grants, not loans. These are grants and they will be allocated based on the difference between what they made in 2019, the revenues in 2019 and the revenues in 2020. And that difference, that deficit they're eligible for a grant to cover that. Um, so they need to start collecting their information. If they haven't filed their tax return, that's fine. But we need to have them have that information available so that they can apply right away and be first in line to take advantage of the set aside for women, for minorities, uh, for veterans. Um, so that because this there will not be enough money for all the demand nationally. So working with you, we can make sure that our people uh, are first in line and can take advantage of it. Thank you, Congressman. That's really exciting, Congressman, to hear. Um, we do, as, as you know, since Multnomah County licenses restaurants and bars in, 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 in the county, we um, could send out an email to folks, you know, ASAP getting the appropriate information out. So I'll have uh, Justin on our team our lobbyists work with um, folks from your team so that we can get that information out to our uh, restaurants ASAP. Well, that would be great, Madam Chair. And one thing we might even think about later in the month is maybe inviting uh, some of your restaurants to be part of a Zoom call where we can prevent, pre present the information, answer their questions, try and build, build some momentum if that's useful. I'm having these calls around the country. I'd love to have one with you in Multnomah County. We will do it. We will make it happen. Um, I just have one last uh, comment or question if you have a minute before you have to go. Um, I know that throughout your elected career, you've focused on livability 
And these days, uh, livability means helping people find a place to sleep, a safe place to sleep at night. Our board is working uh, to develop a downtown behavioral health resource center so that people who are experiencing homelessness have a centrally located low barrier mental health recovery spot space and a peer run day center. Um, you and I have a meeting scheduled in the next couple of days to talk about more about the specifics, but I wanted to put it on your radar because um, we'd love to have some federal assistance to help make this um, plan come to reality. And also, um, I don't need to tell you how um, homelessness is and the threat of homelessness is is a huge issue here in Portland and Multnomah County. And um, if the eviction moratorium that we have in the state, when it's lifted, there are even going to be more people facing, facing homelessness. So any help that um, the federal um, folks can give us would be would be great. I know that's not just an, an issue here in Multnomah County, it's an issue throughout the country. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I could not agree more. I am pleased that there in again, the administration has proposed a substantial increase in public housing investment and being able to deal with these challenges that we have for the people who simply don't have a place to live and are not capable of being able to generate that on their own. I think what you're talking about is an exciting concept. I'm happy to work with you and hopefully with these various categories and programs, we can find some resources to help you realize that vision. Um, I'm convinced it'll more than pay for itself if we can put it in place. Thank you. Thank you again for coming this morning. It's great to see you. I um, have to reiterate the comments that one of my colleagues made earlier that you are um, always so accessible to us and such a great partner to Multnomah County. Thank you. Well, I guess we're done. So I'll just <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, we'll do, we'll no, do another we will we'll have we will have you question. all morning if possible. Does anybody else have questions or comments for Commissioner Congressman? <laughs> all of the above, William and our representative. <laughs> okay, well, I don't want to make you late for the rest of the agenda, uh, but uh, I just want to conclude by saying how much I appreciate what I said earlier about your having uh, the most important role and that most people don't fully appreciate. I think almost no one fully appreciates it unless they're in the middle of it. Uh, and uh, I think uh, you've done an extraordinary job and look forward to continuing to try and uh, make progress on these intractable problems that we uh, that we just cannot afford to ignore and where it looks like we're going to have more resources to do something with them. Such a change from a year ago when we were starting off this um, horrible pandemic, just a change um, in the top. And I know that gives us all great hope. Thank you. Good day. All right. Justin Black, Vicki Cram. Sherry Campbell and the entire team here to talk about our federal agenda. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, for the record, uh, as we say in Salem, uh, I'm Justin Black. I am the Director of Government Relations here at Multnomah County. Um, and I'll just give a little brief overview of what we're going to talk about today and kind of our agenda, and then I will hand it off. Um, so really, um, as you may remember, um, we started this process of creating a federal agenda um, almost two years ago. Um, and because of, um, you know, the the what was happening at the federal level and then COVID, we really had to put this on the back burner and deal with fires that were happening at the federal level and reacting to those. We are finally in that place where we can talk about a proactive uh, agenda at the federal level, and we're very excited about this. Um, so today we're going to have Vicki Cram, who represents us uh, with 
uh, at the federal level, um, talk about what's happening at Congress and what's upcoming and give us some high points uh, from her perspective. Uh, she has been integral in all of our conversations around ARPA, CARES, um, getting the federal delegation to help us bring down as much funding as we could locally, um, but also help us interpret interpret CARES Act and ARPA as they happened um, because they are complex uh, pieces of legislation. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to Vicki, uh, who will start off her process, and then we'll come back to Sherry and I to talk about the agenda itself. Vicki, take it away. Great. Thank you, Justin. Um, for the record, I'm Vicki Cram with Squire Patton Boggs in Washington, D.C., and it's a pleasure to see you all here this morning. Um, I thought I would just start by adding on to some of the comments that um, uh, Congressman Blumenauer made. One was... Um, one note I wanted to make was that in addition to the 28.6 billion that he inserted his restaurants act into the rescue plan, there is also um, funding. It's uh, 16 billion for the shuttered venue operators grants, and those are going to open online on April 8th. Um, and that's for art centers, movie theaters, museums, zoos, etc. So that is another program that uh, we've been working on, which I know is a desperate need to a lot of places that just have not been able to open up at all, um, in addition to the restaurant community. Um, and that will be, you can find that on the Small Business Administration website um, for those who may be listening who uh, are a shuttered venue operator. There is also in the rescue plan, um, also under the Small Business Administration, a community navigator program that has not yet opened up, but it's $100 million um, as a pilot program for communities to be able to, um, to be able to link their businesses with these programs. So I think that might be of interest uh, to all of you too, as we were just discussing. Um, in addition to the American Rescue Plan and the proposed infrastructure package, which President Biden has proposed, which I'm happy to answer questions about if you need more information, I thought I would touch briefly on immigration because I know that that's an issue that is of a lot of interest to all of you. Um, and there have been, there's been a lot of activity on that and there is a overview of immigration that Sherry Campbell has if any of you want more information on it than I'm about to give you. But um, on day one of the Biden administration, January 20th, uh, the president out, uh, rolled out an executive um, order ensuring accurate enumeration of the decennial census. And on January 22nd, the census uh, the Commerce Department, the Census Division announced that it will not include citizenship or immigration in as part of the 2020 census. Um, and then the president issued a memorandum uh, on preserving and fortifying deferred action for childhood arrivals. So there were a number of other early actions um, ending discriminatory, discriminatory bans on entry to the US, termination of an emergency at the southern border, and direct and redirection of the funds at the southern border. Um, the White House recently announced a broad immigration legislation called the US Citizenship Act of 2020, um, and it provides a pathway to citizenship. It prioritizes smart border controls and provides an eight year path to citizenship for most undocumented in immigrants, but shortens it to three years for certain people like dreamers those and those with temporary protect, protected status or farm workers. So that's only a three year window for them and not an eight year window as it is for other undocumented immigrants. And the bill was introduced in the House by um, Congresswoman Linda Sanchez and in the Senate by um, Senator Menendez. Um, the president also began plans and actions to reunify families separated at the border and wind down the remain in Mexico policy put in place by President Trump. And in March, the Department of Homeland Security said it would no longer defend the public charge rule, which I know is a concern to us. And the Department of Justice requested that the Supreme Court dismiss the case. Also in March, the Biden administration asked the Supreme Court to dismiss appeals pending to withhold Department of Justice funds for jurisdictions deemed sanctuary jurisdictions. 
So that's what the administration has been doing in the house on March 18th, the house passed HR 6, which is called the American dream and promise act. And that would provide legal status and a path to citizenship for dreamers. Shortly afterwards, the house also passed HR 1603. The farm worker, the farm workforce modernization act, which would provide legal status and a path to citizenship to undocumented agricultural workers. So prospects in the Senate for these bills is a little murkier. Um, Senator Manchin of West Virginia, who um, is a key player in the Senate these days, has pointed to a bill from uh, 2013 that might be the starting point for conversations in the Senate. Um, but the new ruling in the Senate regarding of the Senate parliamentarian regarding the ability to use this reconciliation process more than once. Um, which will be potentially the pathway for the infrastructure bill to move through the Senate has already been raised as the potential for being able to use immigration reform through the Senate with only a 51 vote majority. So I just wanted to touch base on that a little bit because I know that the uh, congressman uh, presented on the rescue plan and on the infra proposed infrastructure package, and I'm happy to take any questions uh, that you might have for me. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, do any of the commissioners have questions? I'll just run through real quick and see if there's questions or comments for Vicki. Uh, we'll start with Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Vicki, it's so great to see you. Thank you so much for joining our East County Issue Forum a month or so ago, but it's always great to hear from you and hear the exciting things that are happening at the federal level. Really excited to hear about that $16 billion for shuttered venues. I wasn't aware of that. so. Uh, That'll, that'll benefit a lot of struggling businesses. Um, I was wondering, and, and um, yeah, I mean, the dreamer work and the path to citizenship, uh, hopefully uh, those things will, will continue forward. Uh, and also really excited to hear about this reconciliation process, which just sounds like it's just uh, kind of a path forward for us to uh, move some things forward that we might not otherwise be able to move forward. Uh, so I don't really have any uh, questions other than uh, I, it's always great to see you and thank you so much for your advocacy uh, for Multnomah County. Thank you. Commissioner Vicki Peterson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thanks so much, Vicki. It was, it's really good to see you. Um, it looks like it's a beautiful day wherever you are out there, just like it is here. So that's wonderful. Um, I had one question. So, first of all, I really appreciate um, the update that you've just given us around um, immigration, but also all of the updates that you've been sending, you know, over the past you know year on what's been happening in DC and what's been happening at the federal level. It's been so helpful to be able to have that, and, and Sherry's done a great job of of conveying that information and answering questions too. So, really appreciate um, how how much you're working to keep us informed. Um, the one question I do have it relates to. You know, some of the administrative dis administration's decisions to not defend, like, for instance, the public charge rule, right? So, but these cases are still before the Supreme Court. And so I was just curious how much, what should we be concerned about what the Supreme Court is going to decide to do with these cases? I know that there's some pressure on them from some folks to still move forward with some of these cases. So, what is the outlook around that? I think I'm not a judicial expert, but I do think that with the uh, administration stepping back and choosing not to to either not to move forward with the case or not to defend the case. Uh, I think that that gives us um, some measure of relief and comfort that these may not move forward. I think it, it gives us more relief than we would have had otherwise. Um, but I, I'm not. I work for a law firm, but I'm not a lawyer, so I actually don't know exactly if if uh, people wanted to continue to pursue this, um, then it would, it could potentially go to the Supreme Court. But I think since these were actions that were largely taken by the administration under the Trump administration and the fact that the Biden administration is stepping back from them um, makes a difference. Thank you. Yeah, and that would be my hope as well, especially like it kind of takes the, 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 the impetus away, but I know that there are still people who are trying to push it forward. So um, anything you hear on that, you know, feel free to share. Thank you. I will. No more questions. Commissioner Myron. 
thank you, um, Vicki. I too want to add my appreciation. Um, and I, I too had not heard about the, the, is it the $16 billion um, for the sheltered, uh, the sheltered venue operators grants. So that, that um, was really exciting to hear about and um, yeah, just appreciate, uh, appreciate you and your work. So thank you. Thank you. Justin. Great. What do you got well, next for you. us? Yep. Uh, thank you, Vicki. Um, so now we're going to go through um, the federal agenda as proposed and Tasha has our PowerPoint on this. Uh, that she'll be sharing, um, you know, and I really want to say that this was the process we go through with this is we work with each department to identify um, what what the county needs at a program level, um, both from the federal and state government and figure out um, kind of our agenda from there. And then working with each of your offices, make sure that we're that we're in, in line with your priorities as well and making sure that we're not missing anything. So um, if we go to the next slide, Tasia. Um, one of the things that is most important is the amount of federal funding that the county gets. Now, these are, I, I, I do have to put a big asterisk on this. Um, this is not a Christian Elkin slide. This is a government relations slide. So please don't infer any budget impacts by this slide. Um, these are some big numbers that we wanted to put out there just to show the magnitude of the federal funds coming. So, you know, the county in FY20 received about $76 million in reimbursements from Medicaid and Medicare, all from the federal government, as well as $57 million in appropriated program funding. This is direct payments from the federal uh, from federal government, like for um, the health department, for DCHS, and for other programs, as well as grants that we receive, like the Burns JAG grant and other grants uh, that we apply for. Um, in addition to that, you know, as CARES, um, or as the COVID, vac COVID uh, pandemic has has rolled through, the federal government has has at times uh, deemed us worthy of receiving additional federal funds. So um, there was the $28 million in direct appropriations uh, that we received through the CARES Act. Um, and as you'll remember, a much larger number went to the city of Portland and to the state, um, but we were able to realize um, some of that money as well to bring into county programs. And then uh, most recently, the $157 million uh, that's coming through ARPA um, in direct payment to the county to provide more services. Now, I will say, you know, none of these numbers actually get everything that we're getting from the feds. Um, so we are receiving additional dollars for rent assistance, testing, vaccine rollout. Um, some of those dollars come directly via formula from the federal government. Some of those dollars actually come through the state. Um, and so there's many ways that we receive federal money into the county, but all of that federal money goes to support mission critical programs here at the county. So as we are developing um, our federal agenda, you know, our first lens is the amount of resources we get from the feds to support programs uh, that are vitally important to the county and to its residents. Uh, next slide, Tasia. So we broke um, our advocacy down into, um, I think it's eight buckets, um, to hopefully to make it more easily digestible. And the frame we use, um, I'll just continue this, is, um, you know, Multnomah County as a safety net provider and payer. So when we look at programs at the federal government funds, we start with the safety net programs. Um, and, and that's that's the cornerstone of all the work here. So, you know, when we look at mitigating health and physical impacts of COVID-19, we look on how that's going to impact our residents, particularly the most vulnerable, um, so that they can reclaim their health and their future. So we're advocating for necessary funding to align policies to support individuals, families, healthcare systems, and small businesses. And that includes, you know, uh, investment in broad-based infrastructure programs um, like the Burnside Bridge that would provide uh, much-needed jobs in an economy that's a, a little tumultuous at the time. That includes expanding broadband to everybody, um, as we've learned, you know, especially with everybody working from home and school being virtual. Um, that uh, broadband is ever more important, and that just that doesn't mean just 
um, laying down new fiber optic cables um, so that people have access. That also makes means that we're actually helping people who can't afford broadband be able to access broadband in their community so that their kids and them, they can um, keep up with everybody else. Um, and as always, you know, in our work, we try to lead um, with race in our work and look at dismantling systematic, systematic race, systematic racism. Um, and so right now we're focusing on President Biden's January 20th, um, 21 executive order committing federal agencies to a comprehensive and systematic approach to advance equity for all people, including people of color and others who have been historically underserved, marginalized and adversely affected by the persistent poverty and equities of our system. Um, so we will continue to follow uh, that executive order and make sure that it's being implemented, um, but also you know, join the call to repeal executive orders from the previous administration that created and normalized a lot of racist policies and practices. Um, and we look at this you know, from a systemic um, systems point of view and look at those things where additional funding can be helpful, but also just removing barriers and other places for people to receive services and, and get what they need. Um, next slide, Tasia. Next slide, Tasia. Oh, oh, sorry. Go back one. Sorry. I got confused there. Um, your sorry, your um, your graphic design is maybe just a little land so all your slides kind of look like i just think justin you're doing a great job uh, i i think that's uh absolutely correct and so uh Tasha, go one more slide forward yes uh, i think you know as we go into the next budget cycle here at the county we do need to talk about a graphic designer at the government relations office just kidding. Um, so, um, as I talked about safety net, um, you know, we need to ensure that benefits keep pace with actual costs. This is something we see both at the state, federal, and local level of the cost of actually providing services becomes more and more expensive every year. And funding from our sources doesn't always keep up with the expense of providing these services. So, you know, we will advocate um, for, you know, funding programs like SNAP, TANF, and WIC. Um, and making sure that the, the, the funding for those keeps up with the actual cost of providing those programs. Um, you know, because at, at the core, these federal programs are integral to the county's effort to support individuals who are experiencing homelessness and to ensure that safety and well being for vulnerable children, families, disabled aging residents, uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, and trafficking survivors are met, um, and that we are providing a robust array of services for those individuals so that they can live their best life possible. Um, with that comes supporting um, and reducing, or sorry, uh, reducing homelessness uh, and improving housing resources. It was great to hear Congressman Blumenauer talk about, you know, a, re a renewed investment in HUD um, and things like VASH, the Veteran Affairs Supportive Housing Program, um, Housing Choice Vouchers, Home Investment Partnerships, um, Section 8 Housing. We need to see an increase in all of those programs so that we can provide supportive housing and long-term housing for individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Um, the other part that we need to advocate for is not just increased funding, but increased flexibility. Um, one of the things that Multnomah County does really good is integrate a lot of different programs so that if someone is coming, you know, through one door to receive one service, that we make sure that they can take advantage of other services that are out there and get a full wraparound service. Um, we also want to make sure that people have access to everything, regardless of gender identity, regardless of immigration status, um, and regardless of what language they speak at home. So we got to make sure that there is more flexibility for those funds. I'll stop because I've talked a lot um, and hand it over to Sherry with the next slide. Good morning, Sherry. Up, oh, you're on mute. Sherry, you're on mute. I apologize. Sorry. <laughs> and once again, for the record, my name is Sherry Campbell, and I'm with the Office of Government Relations and the Federal Liaison. And I'm going to pick up the last 
four uh, buckets, uh, priority buckets that we've uh, talked about um, and is cleared from what Justin said and what I'm about to say, these are all um, completely intermingled. And um, so the next one is expanding access to health and human resources and services. Um, once again, we're really focused on the, the vulnerable populations that have um, often dropped between services, but also in the last four years, we're really marginalized from accessing services. And while the Biden administration has done a great job up till now in really kind of uh, starting to address some of those, it's going to take a long time to both rebuild the trust and the, the infrastructure necessary to, pro to meet those needs. Um, we are um, really in, we're committed to broadening and securing access. Um, who knows what's going to happen in the future? So if we can broaden access to healthcare and behavioral health care moving forward and really secure that so that um, trust will continue to build and we'll be able to make sure that access is, um, it continues. Um, and uh, in particularly an emphasis on behavioral health funding, I think there's a lot of, as you may know, structural issues that um, prevent people from accessing those, um, those services and also reimbursement models that make it very difficult for us to sustain those services as well um, and continuing to address those. Um, next is an effective and equitable public safety system. We have been working so hard on this locally, and it's exciting to have the federal government in a place where we can partner with them to start moving these intractable issues forward. Um, justice reform is something that everybody's been talking about, and I think we've been working so hard locally to define what that means. And um, what, what we're seeing now is that we have the potential of having funding streams from the federal government that will not only just strip out the sanctuary city language that was such a frustration for us for the last several years, but also provide a platform for us to really move forward some of the vision that um, Lipsick and the commissioners have had for being able to move it forward. And we can't not talk about equitable public safety systems and weave in the, the need for racial, for addressing uh, racial ethnic disparities that are so pronounced. And frankly, we are national leaders in identifying those disparities. Um, and now we need and will seek federal support in being able to address them. Next slide. Once again, it looks just the same. Um, improving resiliency, and I know we really talked about this in the earlier part, um, and we have it in our agenda. Um, there is one of the interesting things that um, I saw in an email exchange the other day is that we have to push harder on the um, issues around the um, earthquake readiness. And the Burnside Bridge is the capstone project for that. Um, but there's a lot of other regional issues that um, are huge and the reality of, well, the, the reality of the cascade subduction zone is true and we need to keep moving forward with that and pushing it at the federal level to get the support we need. Linked to that, um, our emergency services network has been um, pushed to the extreme in the last year. And one can only imagine how that would be impacted um, in the event of an earthquake. So really kind of shoring up those, um, those services and those networks um, to be prepared. And finally, we get to actually change our language around climate action from kind of saying, hello, we need to do something about climate to being able to say, we're emphasizing this and we can lock elbows with the federal government to move it forward. Um, the uh, Biden administration has an all agency approach to the climate crisis, and um, they are very focused on moving that out to local partners. And the good news is, is that we're way ahead of the efforts at the federal level, and we are prepared um, for to, to partner with them and to implement some of their vision. And uh, one of the things we've been way in front of is ensuring that communities of color are prioritized in that effort. And um, I really believe that there's going to be great opportunities for us to kind of push those efforts forward uh, in partnership with the federal government. Yeah. 
Thank you, Sherry. Um, so that's the end of our presentation. Um, you know, in, in your Jeff board packet, um, you should have a, a longer version of the federal agenda uh, to dive deep into. And I think you've all seen it beforehand. So we will stop there if there's any questions, um, but that is the proposed federal agenda for you all uh, in the upcoming Congress. Thank you, team. Uh, questions, comments from the board. Commissioner Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Justin and Sherry and Vicki for this presentation. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to call out uh, was the reimbursement model. Absolutely. I know you're always advocating on our behalf. Uh, the cost of doing business and not getting reimbursed for the that cost is incredibly important and affects our general fund greatly. So I appreciate that work. And it's pretty exciting. Uh, it's sad, but exciting that we are uh, formally uh, requesting the federal government to work with us around eliminating racial and ethnic disparities. Uh, that's absolutely critical. Uh, it's one thing to take a, a, a stand, but as we know, uh, getting the funding to execute on the things that we need to make changes in is often more challenging. Than that, so I appreciate that work, and then of course the the climate crisis. I'm really excited uh, to have a federal administration who understands uh, how dire of a situation our environment is in, and is willing to make some uh, significant changes uh, to to our country. And so uh, again, thank you all for your work. Uh, none of this is too much of a surprise because you all work with each of our offices. So again, I just appreciate all of your advocacy and hard work. Thank Commissioner you. Commissioner Peterson. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Justin and Sherry um, for, for um, delivering this presentation. I have to say it's, some of these things are things that we've had in, in previous years, but it just feels so much better to have some of these things on there and know that we have a, an administration that we can actually partner with on and see progress and investment and um, and really like moving forward on a lot of these things where for too long we've been um, we've been having to play defense and having to wait out crises that really we didn't have any time to lose on like climate and racism. So um, so this is really exciting to see this agenda. Um, I agree with Commissioner Stegman, um, you know, the work, um, it, having racism being a, a very specific part of our federal um, priorities, I think is um, is naming it and working for it and prioritizing it in the way that we have to address this crisis. And so I'm so glad we've, we've done that. Same thing with climate. Um, we need to be looking at this across the board and um, in all the ways that we can, um, we can look at um, responding to the climate crisis. Um, including through you know, the investments we're making as part of the economic response to COVID. Um, and, um, and I think that um, what we have in terms of um, the, the really having a, a government that understands the role that uh, local governments and specifically county governments hold in, um, in supporting our um, safety net, or as Earl Blumenauer says, the government of last resort, like, you know, that, um, that we, you know, that we need to be invested in, we need to be investing in these structures because we're really, we're really um, holding people um, up and trying to provide safety and stability to so much of our population. And so, and, and I just love how that um, our federal priorities are reflecting that. So thanks so much. And, and, I know it's going to be a lot of work to push these forward, and so I just appreciate um, the work that you're doing and Vicki's doing on all of that. Commissioner Myron. Um, thank you so much, uh, Justin and uh, Sherry. And uh, I, I mean, I would echo uh, what Commissioner Vega Peterson uh, just said about the just the feeling being so much different, like it really, it it is palpable um, to have these conversations and feel like, oh my gosh, there's there's hope and there's potential here and there's true partnership. Um, and so it's really exciting. And, um, you know, just some, some uh, things that you mentioned that I wanted to call out that I'm uh, particularly, just thrilled about um, are, 
you know, talking about expanding uh, expansion of broadband and um, and really having that be a potential reality. Uh, very exciting. Um, and uh, just. I appreciate uh, Justin, you're talking about increasing the, um, you know, ensuring that there's flexibility. It's, it's not just that we need the additional resources, which we do, but we need to be able to use those um, in a way that actually need meets the needs of the people we serve. And so often without that flexibility and funding, um, you know, our, our hands are tied and so uh, appreciate your calling that out. Um, love, love, love the um, discussion of the increase in behavioral health funding. That is wonderful. And I, I also appreciate the chair calling that out and um, and uh, her uh, prioritizing that with uh, Congressman Blumenauer as well and our investment in the Behavioral Health Resource Center. That is, it's so exciting to have that be like a, a thing that can be front and center and be, can be um, elevated uh, even at the federal level and have that be potentially a reality. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess, uh, yeah, resiliency, um, Thinking about the CEI, uh, the central, the energy infrastructure hub, and uh, how all the fuel passes through, you know, all 90% of the fuel in our state passes through that, you know, decrepit, crumbling facility uh, that is in my district and borders on Commissioner Jaipal's district. And um, in the event of an earthquake, uh, that it will be destroyed, there will be all of our um you know that will impact all of our state and being able to elevate that and have that have a meaningful place in conversation i mean all of this is so everything is so um important to the work that we do directly on the front line at the county and uh to be able to have these cons kinds of conversations and see uh the elevation of these issues in our uh federal federal legislative agenda is just um truly thrilling. So thank you. Not only is it exciting to be talking about these issues, we're actually having a conversation about what could be possible with this new administration. I don't think I've, well, we haven't had this in, in the, at least obviously the past four years. So it is extremely exciting. And also to note that not only was Congressman Blumenauer a county commissioner, but for the first time ever, we have a president who was a county commissioner. So I feel like it's not a coincidence that we got our own larger allocation of um, ARPA funds this time around. I think that NACO and, and all of our team did a great job lobbying, but it was, it was coming to ears who understand the importance of local government and especially of the great work that the counties do. So thank you all again, team, for the briefing this morning. Great to see you, Vicki, since I know we can't get on that airplane and come visit you in Washington, D.C., so it's, it's great to see you virtually. And we will have more conversations about this in the days to come as our congressional delegation is all out in full force wanting to talk with us about our priorities. Justin, do you have anything to add before we close it down? Uh, I, I think the only thing is, um, so the um, adoption of the agenda will be on the cons consent agenda on Thursday, and um, we really appreciate all your guys' help in putting this together, too. I could, if I could add, if you don't mind, it's a pleasure Please. to work for all of you commissioners and to see you today, and that you have this fabulous team with Justin and Sherry, and they're wonderful to work with. So it's, uh, it is a new day, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. All right, that was some good news for the morning. And next, our next briefing, I hope will be other additional good news, or at least interesting. Um, we have our regular board briefing on the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think the public health team and um, ICS are here to talk about what's going on in the world. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Vines, I think you are kicking things off this morning. I'm not. I am. 
I am. Good morning, Chair. Can I just get a thumbs up that you can hear and see me okay? Yep. Thumbs are up. Great. All good. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, for the record, I'm Jennifer Vines. I'm your Multnomah County Health Officer. Uh, I'm your MC today because Jessica Guernsey is taking a much needed week off, and so I hope she's not listening. And if she were here, she would say something really eloquent about National Public Health Week. Um, and not only your support at your level, which we're so grateful for, uh, but all of the people who work in public health and even those not even in the public health division, but who are now have now been sort of deputized, uh, so to speak, in the public health efforts around uh, our response to this pandemic uh, and to health disparities and so many other aspects of our well-being uh, that we all have a hand in. So um, special thanks to you all and to our county workforce uh, on this uh, special uh, National Public Health Week. Um, I think, Teja, you have our PowerPoint. You're going to hear from me, the amazing Kim Taves, our Communicable Disease Director, and Adrian Daniels, who's our Integrated Clinical Services Deputy Director. If you'd advance, Teja. Um, so I'm going to take you through our usual uh, COVID-19 data just to show you kind of where we are and what we're thinking in the world of public health. Uh, Kim Tays has great information for you around where we are with the vaccine, and Adrian will chime in as well uh, with the reach of uh, Multnomah County in terms of COVID-19 vaccine and our dashboard. Next slide, please. So um, here's our go-to for any kind of communicable disease. This is our epidemic curve, which uh, shows us how many cases over time. Um, you can see there's a little bump up there in cases. I would say the mood in public health this week is not alarmed, but uneasy. Um, we'll see if that bump looks more like a small one, like last summer, or if it's in fact uh, the first in a steep rise like we saw last fall. Um, I say that, and for whoever is listening, the answer to that question is very much in our hands. So our ability to get vaccine to people who are eligible as quickly as possible, uh, people continuing to take precautions, especially indoors where it's still very important to mask and maintain distance and pay attention to ventilation. All of those things remain important as we try to avoid what is uh, uh, un, un, uh, rolling out in other jurisdictions, both within the United States and around the globe of an expansion of the epidemic. Uh, partly driven by newer, more contagious variants. I think also partly driven by pandemic fatigue and a notion that we've, we've sort of hit the, the deadline of vaccines are here. Um, and while there certainly are things that fully vaccinated people can do uh, safely, um, we certainly are not out of the woods at this point and many people in our region remain susceptible to this virus. Um, next slide, please, Teja. Uh, this is, again, our window into testing volume. Um, so our percent positivity takes into account how many people are getting tested. Uh, you can see that there's been a drop, and we're hearing that testing sites are slowing down. Um, that worries us a little bit because the lower the volume of testing, the less confident we are in our picture of how many people are truly positive. So when lots of people are getting tested, we have a, a higher resolution uh, photo, if you will, of what's happening um, as far as virus uh, presence and transmission. When fewer people are getting tested, it can kind of the percent positive can kind of bounce around, and we lose um, we lose uh, our confidence um, uh, in how much virus we have spreading. But you can see, for the record, um, people are still getting tested. Uh, we remain in a fairly comfortable range of again that less than five percent. Um, but there is a little bit of worry that um, testing overall just may be lower and we may not be uh, fully seeing uh, the picture of uh, COVID-19 presence and transmission. Next slide, please. Okay, so here are hospitalizations. This is uh, in many ways the, the North Star of COVID-19, right? This is what we're trying to prevent is the most severe versions of this disease. Uh, some people think of this indicator as the purest. Um, because uh, it, it gets to those more, more severe forms and it's not so much subject to um, uh, changes in testing volume or other uh, sort of human behaviors that we can't fully account for. Um, and so you can see that hospitalizations are very, very low. Uh, remember, though, that as we climb up a curve, if we climb that curve, hospitalizations will follow 
And we can hope that we've reached enough high risk people and will continue to reach enough high risk people. Um, so, so older people, as you know, those with underlying health conditions, the sooner we can reach them with vaccine, um, hopefully the, uh, this curve will not follow um, an increase in cases. But again, that is, that is in our hands, um, all of us together in terms of um, taking vaccine when we're eligible and can get it and continuing uh, COVID precautions for the time being until we see uh, until we see how this spring actually unfolds. Next slide. Um, I'm before we hand it off to Kim Taves to talk about vaccine. I don't know, Chair, if you want to open it up for questions just about where we are. Yep, definitely. That was a lot, a lot of, a lot of information in those slides. Um, we'll start with Commissioner Meyer. Do you have questions or Dr. Okay. Vines or comments? Yeah, um, thank you so much, Dr. Vines, and the happiest, uh, or I don't know if happiest is the word, public health week um, to you, uh, you know, the public health week of all public health weeks. Um, I um, just had a question in terms of, and, and we might get to this later, but uh, the question of the variants and, um, you know, I think about this a lot that like, we're, you know, I hear we're seeing the declining infection rates, but that's masking a rise in sort of this more content, more contagious, deadlier form of the virus that actually is spreading. Um, and, and I read a New York times article actually, that even was talking about treating some of the variants as a new and separate you know, virus, like this is a new, but you need to be looking at these rates. And um, I would, I would just be curious about your thoughts about the variants and if we're testing for them, if we should be testing for them and what we should be, if, if we should be doing things differently um, in light of those uh, concerns. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner. So we have had relatively low visibility on variants um, in Oregon and nationally, but that's changing. Um, so OHSU is uh, starting to study uh, specific viruses. Our public health lab is able to do this kind of study. And so we're, we're going to start to get a fuller picture of the presence of variants uh, in our region. We should assume that they're here. But not all variants are the same. So some variants are emerging um, where scientists think they can actually get around the immune system response, including the, the, the immune system response from vaccine. Those are very worrisome. And that's where those types of headlines come from. Uh, we, we kind of feel like we're starting over. Um, I think those are still relatively rare. Uh, there are other variants that are more common um, that scientists are finding maybe get around an antibody response, which is kind of your, your frontline and your, your first response to an infection, but that still um, triggers uh, the more complicated uh, actions of your immune system uh, to respond. And so therefore, uh, uh, I've, it's, many scientists are confident that at least for some variants, vaccines should continue to work. I think the bottom line is that we are in a, a race here between getting people vaccinated partly to protect them from the, the viruses that are circulating now, and also partly just to stop the virus from mutating. So viruses change as they spread and infect different people and grow and multiply. So it'll, it's a double win to get people vaccinated as quickly as possible. So for anybody listening, continuing to take precautions is buying us time. So it's buying us time and it's minimizing the virus's chance to spread around and change more and acquire new ways of getting around our immune system. So the short answer to your question, Commissioner, is I think we'll have more information in the coming, um, I would say the next one to two weeks uh, from my understanding. And I think there we'll have a better picture of what our actual risk is uh, in terms of a more contagious, potentially more severe variant, either causing a surge or um, causing concern for uh, getting getting around the vaccines that we're using now, which I hope is really unlikely. That's it. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Vines. Commissioner Vega-Peterson. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Dr. Vines, for this information. I just had a couple of questions. Um, you know, I think the um, the graph that you had that shows that text testing is lower, lowering. I mean, we've had dips in testing when there hasn't been as much prevalence of COVID in our community, and we're kind of in that path, although we have the bump. I guess, you know, my thought is we've never done a good job in this country of normalizing testing and having the access to testing that we should have since day one. I mean, I remember like a year ago talking about just how hard it was because of components and the testing itself and, and all of those things. Um, and so, you know, I guess at this point, like what what can we do around testing? Is it as as we're really focused on vaccine and trying to get those vaccines um, out into the public and, and setting up, you know, sites to do that? Um, you know, what what can we do to um, encourage people to get testing if they're um, if they're concerned? I mean, I because that, that's what I think. I think like, you know, Eight months ago, we were everybody was concerned about how do I get tested if I have it, and I don't. I just don't think that that's as big of concern anymore. People are more focused on, um, people are more focused on, on on getting the vaccine. And and again, we have never put in the systems in place to make testing just more, you know, ubiquitous. Right. So again, human behavior is, is hard to predict, and it can be hard to influence. Um, but you're right that, I mean, our advice still applies to anyone who's feeling poorly. We, we recommend that you get tested for COVID-19. If you've had a known exposure, we're going to recommend that you get tested for COVID-19. Uh, we have a capacity to do rapid testing um, in, in, in other places to help uh, find infections uh, early. I think, um, I, so I can't, I can't fully understand your question, I can't fully answer your question with, with, a, with a tidy a plan to get more people tested. I will say that it becomes a catch-22 if, if we think there's actually less transmission, then um, then the test is the chance that any given test is going to be positive ends up being low. As we see more virus, then the chance that your test is uh, going to be positive starts starts to increase. Um, and I think as people have partly pandemic fatigue. Um, uh, uh, partly just feeling like, you know, maybe they're, they're low risk, but, you know, they're no longer worried about putting their elders at risk because their elders have been vaccinated. I don't think we have a clear picture on the behavioral piece of the role of testing uh, as we go forward, but there's, there's no question that it remains part of controlling this virus is for people who have it to know they have it, to isolate, and for people they've come into contact with to similarly to, to quarantine, stay away from others, and get tested. And when I turn it over to Kim Taves, I'll, I'll see if she wants to add anything because um, she does it all. She she also has a hand in our in our testing sites in addition to vaccine. Uh, great. Yeah. Thank you. And I just um, and I appreciate that you can't really answer the question because it's it's hard to. But just encourage people, you know, that testing is still an important piece of of the response to COVID. Um, I think we just need to get that message out a little bit more than we than we have been because we've been everybody's so excited about the vaccines and the possibilities there. Um, the other thing is, so there, I was just reading that the governor has a new metric for the extreme risk levels at the state level, um, where it's really looking more at hospitalizations. You know, so as we're as we're seeing increases in cases, um, you know, and and that's going up and down. Do we know what that that might mean for Multnomah County? I know it had to do with um, trying to balance the fact that a lot of places have people um, who are going to hospitals from regionally, like going to places to hospitals um, for care in those cases then being counted for that county. It, do we see that, um, you know, that this being a more accurate way to depict what's happening in Multnomah County? Yeah, I, I agree with where I think the state is going in looking at hospital capacity and COVID hospitalizations. Um, because as we get more high risk people vaccinated, then we start to see transmission among lower risk people, so younger people. And for the record, no, no age group is off limits in terms of the potential for complications from this virus, including down to young infants. Um, and similarly, there's this new sort of long term COVID, long COVID that we don't completely understand. So I don't want to make it sound like there's no risk to younger people. Um, but I, I agree that the state is pivoting towards this goal of minimizing viral spread and keeping hospitals from being overwhelmed so that people don't die unnecessarily from COVID-19 or from other illnesses um, that require hospital attention. Um, so I think uh, they're just starting to make that pivot. 
Um, but as with all things COVID, it's it's a it's a complicated equation in terms of how we think of risk um, and what level of risk we as a community are willing to accept, knowing that um, especially with potentially more contagious versions of the virus, it's it's a numbers game, and so the virus will find its way into someone uh, and potentially make them either very sick uh, or cause some of these poorly understood longer term complications. Um, so that's going to be the new sort of, I think, the new lens for how we think about restrictions. Thank you. And I, I just want to say I really appreciate your comment about um, the long COVID, you know, impacts and the fact that we, um, you know, that anyone can have get COVID and also have um, have um, pretty severe impacts from COVID. No one's, you know, no one's immune, as you said, because um, I think about that as we're looking in the next month or so of having so much of the adult population eligible for vaccines, getting vaccinated, we still don't have a vaccine that's approved yet for children. And so, and I, I know as a, as a mom, you know, my worst fear is that we are adults, you know, are vaccinated. And so we, we start doing more things and then, and then one of my kids would get it. And so, you know, the, the other hope I have is that we have a, um, a vaccine that's approved for use on, on children, you know, in, in the next couple months as well, so that we can, we can have even more immunity and, and get closer to that herd immunity. Thanks. Mr. Stegman. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Vines. Uh, along the same lines, I'm just wondering, like, are we seeing uh, more youth uh, contracting uh, COVID-19? Uh, so I'm just wondering, like, the, in the hospitalizations, and I, I think you do track the ages, is that correct? We do. Um, hospitalization among children happens, but it's it's very rare, and I'd have to get back to you if you want exact numbers. Um, average age of COVID cases uh, has dropped into roughly the 25 to 45 year old age range, so basically young young younger adults. Um, kids in general, though, are tested less often. Um, it's not fun to test a kid and to, if you have to use the swab that goes all the way back. Um, and uh, sometimes uh, they don't show symptoms uh, or they're in a household where there's COVID and they're just assumed to be infected. So um, again, we don't have a clear answer to that question, but we can talk about generally the age of cases is starting to shift down. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, that was all the questions I have. Great. Great. I um, think, uh, yeah, Kim Taves has the next round of slides. Talk about what's on everybody's mind. Yes. The vaccine. <laughs> Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Kim Taves. I'm the Communicable Disease Director for Multnomah County Public Health. Thanks for inviting me to be here today. Uh, I have updated this slide five times now in the last week or so in preparation for uh, our vaccination update for you today and uh, the governor just released new information again that I think was influenced by the federal change in the timeline for all adults becoming eligible. So where we're at at this moment in time today uh, as of April 6th, uh, the folks who are eligible are folks over 65, folks 16 to 65 with a certain list of medical conditions that the CDC put out that put people at high risk for severe infection. Frontline and agricultural workers and the governor also included their family members are eligible right now. For our federally qualified health centers, which are our primary care outpatient clinics that serve our most vulnerable populations of Medicaid and uh, uninsured folks especially, uh, all those in the state have been able to uh, vaccinate all adults in their patient populations. And for local public health efforts, if we're at a mobile clinic or a specific site that's a community-based site, then we've also been given the okay to vaccinate not only people who are eligible, but their household members too. Uh, that helps, I think, for folks who are in harder to reach populations, not having to keep coming back to a clinic over and over again as each individual member of the household becomes eligible. And we know that household transmission um, in between generations uh, is a significant concern to us, so we appreciate that. Uh, the new news is that on April 19th, all adults will become eligible we were expecting that uh, later, and then it got changed to May 1st, and then as of today, that got moved up again to April 19th. 
Uh, depending on the kind of vaccine that a clinic has, that either means 18 and over or it means 16 and over. One of our three vaccines available right now is able to be used for 16 and 17 year olds. Vaccine is hard to know when it's coming in. It's hard to know uh, which type is coming in and how much is coming in. So um, I will talk about that next with the next slide. Thank you. So where we have vaccine primarily right now is holding steady with the mass vaccination sites, getting up to like 20,000 doses of vaccine a week. Uh, retail pharmacies are expecting and have just probably by today received some increases in doses from the federal government directly. So if you are eligible and you need a vaccine, you may want to go ahead and try again looking at the websites for the retail pharmacies. Uh, most retail pharmacies right now that are in large chain stores from Costco to Safeway to Rite Aid do have some vaccine, Fred Myers, and they all usually have their own appointment scheduling system online. Uh, also, going to the state public health, the Oregon Health Authority website and signing up through their uh, application will give you a notification when there is an appointment spot uh, as well at one of the mass vaccine clinics that you can then respond and sign up for. We had a lot of additional outpatient settings come online. Uh, the state has and the federal government as well have given um, the safety net and community health clinics, those federally qualified health centers, some vaccine now for a good few weeks uh, and more of the other outpatient settings, uh, a handful of um, private clinics as well as some of the health system clinics are starting to get vaccine to vaccinate patient populations. Uh, and in addition then, we still continue to get a vaccine at the local public health. Um, we have not had an increase yet, so we were all hoping for the large surge to come in. We got a little bit of Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which is the one dose only vaccine. Uh, and then there was a problem with the manufacturing of that vaccine. So there's been a pause on that. Um, so we're actually operating at a pretty small amount of vaccine right now. I mentioned that because a lot of employers are wondering when they may be able to have their own uh, occupational health vaccination teams access vaccines so that they can vaccinate their workers. Right now, there is no state or um, vaccination allocation to large employers uh, or small employers, and our regional local health departments don't have enough vaccine coming in to make vaccine available to numerous um, employer settings. So the current word from OHA is that they're trying to outreach to employers to encourage folks to send their frontline workers who are now eligible to those retail pharmacies, to the mass vaccination sign up um, like other people are doing. Uh, and that as soon as we do have more of a surge of vaccine coming into our state uh, that comes to local public health or that the state sets aside directly for employers, we will definitely get the word out to everyone about that. And just to interrupt real quick, Kim, thanks. That's also the message for our employees. So anyone who is, um, any of our employees who are watching or listening in who have not yet been vaccinated um, should go through the um, OHSU website, go through the retail pharmacies or go through the avenues that are open to them. Thank you, next slide please. So the prioritization that we've had on how we have chosen to use the amount of vaccine coming into the local public health, uh, and some of that has been directed pretty specifically from OHA that they've given us certain allocations that have been earmarked for certain populations as well, um, is that we have focused overall on a strategy where we are focusing on uh, black, indigenous, and other communities of color, as well as immigrant communities, as those are the sites of some of the highest disparities that we've had for the last year in COVID infection. And there's some of the challenges uh, due to systemic and structural racism and other barriers to accessing healthcare. Uh, also, we focus our vaccine on where there has been the highest risk for severe illness based on people's own individual age or health conditions, as well as the sites that have tended to be more likely to have outbreaks and um, exposure to other people. So for the last few months, we've been working hard on the residential adult settings, corrections, uh, adult group homes, long-term care facilities. And I think you've all heard a lot of detail about those in previous board briefings. Uh, and with uh, continued focus on racial equity, we're now also expanding to some specific groups that have become eligible recently that may also have barriers to getting into the mass vaccine clinics. So agricultural workers, uh, workers in food processing plants where there have been a lot of outbreaks, 
uh, focus on working with coordinating services to low income senior housing and multi generational housing, people living in homeless shelters, people living outdoors, uh, and some other vulnerable populations. Next slide. So I just want to give some numbers about the vaccine that's come in to date. And we'll be putting up a dashboard soon in the next week that we'll be able to give out those numbers on a week by week setting. Uh, the data management as well as the standing up of all the, the new vaccine work has all been um, considerable for us. So we appreciate your patience with some of that. This shows uh, each bar shows a different week of the last number of 12 weeks or so that we have had vaccine allocations. And the different colors in the different parts of the bars just show which types of vaccine. So you'll see twice we've gotten the red, which is the Johnson and Johnson, the one dose only. And then otherwise we've been getting varying amounts and varying combinations of the Moderna brand and the Pfizer brand. Uh, we don't know uh, how much vaccine we're getting until a few days before the, from the preceding week. Uh, and so it's a little bit hard to do the planning. This vaccine represents um, both first dose and second dose. And I will just mention to folks if they're wondering why we had a, a week with no vaccine and then a week with a lot of vaccine, that's when all the shipments across the country were affected by weather and the vaccine just didn't reach us at all that week. Uh, and it came in then the next week with that vaccine as well. Um, I have an update for this uh, next number of the vaccine distributed from the public health allocation to other vaccinators is actually about 30,000 doses right now. And that has been distributed by us to other vaccine teams that have been helping us to vaccinate vulnerable populations to expand our, our footprint, if you will, or the, the number of sites that we can cover. Uh, the individuals that public health teams alone have vaccinated is over 10,000 individuals so far. We've held about 60 different clinics or days of clinics, I should say, because some days we had clinics going on in multiple settings. About 26 so far of those have been really culturally specific or specifically focused on um, immigrant and BIPOC communities. Others have been um, behavioral health settings, adult care settings. The phase 1A employees was a big chunk of work at first that you all may remember from January and early February as well. This graph doesn't include the vaccine that came into Multnomah County Health Department directly to our own large primary care system, our federally qualified health center. And Adrian is here to talk about that in just a couple of slides. So that's separate from this slide. A couple more slides and then I'll turn it over to Adrian. Uh, next slide is a breakdown for race and ethnicity. I know that's been of um, significant interest to folks. Um, the uh, equity focus is really important again because we've had so many racial and ethnic health disparities uh, in not only the infection rates themselves, but also the amounts of folks that have severe illness or have been hospitalized or died. So that's been a really important focus of us for the vaccination as a prevention strategy. Um, I divided the, the clinics that we've held in public health into two slides. So this first slide is the clinics we've held that have not been specifically focused on communities of color. Um, those again, like I mentioned, are different residential settings, phase 1A employees uh, and other sites. And that's a breakdown by race and ethnicity. The first dark blue bar is the total percent of doses administered. And then the second bar in the light shaded color uh, is the percent for that racial or ethnic group, the percent of the total population. Uh, something we should point out is that a lot of the vaccine has been focused on older populations of folks and different uh, racial and ethnic groups in our county population as a whole have different average ages. So you may have a population that on, in general has more younger folks that may vary um, how we would look at this data, but this is just like a rough estimate sense to give folks to see what the, the comparison is. The next slide is the um, black, indigenous and people of color and immigrant focused clinics specifically. So the blue is the um, breakdown by race and ethnicity. Uh, this is self-reported and there's a, there's a lot more level of detail in here than we can report on a few bars because people um, are asked to uh, identify their own race or their own ethnicity uh, with a number of different options. So people may identify two different races. They may identify um, black and uh, African immigrant and the country of origin. But for the purposes today of giving some big picture that we can present to you visually, this is how we're dividing it today. And so you can see that we um, overall have had uh, great success. The first few clinics that we included 
in this group were not as much um, culturally specific as they were focused on community health workers and medical interpreters. We felt like that was part of our racial equity approach um, because those are folks who may not have had as much likelihood to be employed in hospital systems that were vaccinated, where healthcare workers were vaccinated first. They're also folks that tend to more be from the communities most impacted and working face to face with those communities most impacted. Um, but th that was a, a set of professional uh, folks, traditional health workers who also involved folks across all different racial groups. We also do vaccinate our volunteers. So if we have vaccine um, volunteers show up to any of our vaccine clinics, then they are also eligible. And I do want to mention that we do not exclude anyone from any of our clinics based on race or ethnicity. This is more the idea that we are uh, intentionally focusing promotion and outreach um, to these groups that have had a higher impact and some more significant barriers to access. So uh, we feel great about that role that we have been playing so far uh, in the community among all the vaccination sites in terms of trying to make some equity in uh, access and have that be low barrier. People don't have to show ID. Uh, the sign up is relatively simple. People can sign up um, by phone, not just by computer. Uh, we've got interpreters on site and community based organizations send volunteers so that people see a known and trusted face with them. And we feel like those are all important components of uh, the vaccine being a uh, low barrier. We've also held those clinics at a multiple set of locations, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Next slide, please. This slide is just a quick mention that we did successfully stand up this hub and spoke model, which means we have a small core set of staff drawing up vaccine and sending volunteer teams out to uh, people's homes, if people are homebound, to uh, residential treatment facilities and others. And we are doing uh, an intensive day of that again today and tomorrow and Friday to do the second dose for these folks. Uh, we've reached a lot of different sites and a lot of different people. And now we can use that model that we've built on to um, bring vaccine uh, through a mobile approach to uh, shelters and to other settings where it would be more efficient to just vaccinate everyone on site. Next slide. The other way that we have primarily distributed vaccine is through um, community sites. These have been outside of clinics, Gresham High School, Rockwood Boys and Girls Club, uh, Highland Haven Church, a variety of other settings. Uh, we have a core set of staff doing the work, but we've also really relied on our community partners from community based organizations. Uh, non clinical uh, community members who have stepped up to volunteer as well as clinical volunteers through the Medical Reserve Corps. I just really appreciate the, the cohesive uh, collaborative effort it's taken. We usually vaccinate 200 to 700 people in four to eight hours. Next slide is just where those vaccination sites are. We're um, trying to stand up sites that are regular, uh, that still do have that equity and that BIPOC focus, but are maybe a little bit more regular so that we get more efficient. Uh, each news and different site we go to, we've got to map out the site, do a site visit, change the workflow. And if we can be in some standing places where we leave things set up, leave our supplies and equipment, people know that they might be regular sites to come to, um, then that will be really helpful to have in our toolkit. Uh, so the blue stars there are sites where we either have a commitment or um, this, the one that's along I-5 is PCC, where we have been and we're still in negotiations if we will remain there. Uh, but the other blue stars um, are the sites where we're currently doing testing. And as the testing has decreased, as you heard, we'll be integrating vaccine in the next week or two into those sites. Uh, the farthest east is our new standing vaccine site specifically, which is at Mount Hood Community College. We just started that Saturday. And then the green site is Portland Fire and Rescue through subcontract with us also has stood up a site uh, in Mid County on 122nd and Sandy. The red stars are the primary care clinics, and that's what you will hear about next. So my last slide is just to say that um, we've got, got some comments there from the client satisfaction surveys uh, that we hand out to folks. A uh, vast majority of folks reading us five out of five or four out of five for friendliness, access, uh, clean, simple, uh, easy to get to. Um, that's been really, really important just to hear client feedback so that we can just keep doing process improvements. And with that, maybe uh, you want to pause before Adrian covers the primary care slides. Yep, I think that would be great. Thanks, Thanks okay. Kim. Um, all right, this time we'll start with um, Commissioner Stegman. Do you have questions or comments for Kim? Thank you, 
Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I did have a question and thank you so much uh, for working with our Mount Hood Community College partners. I'm, I'm so glad uh, that, that that is a vaccine site, but I was wondering, so how do people schedule appointments if they wanted to go to the college? So we just had our first clinic uh, Saturday and we're having another clinic right now. Right now we have put the information out through uh, probably upwards of 40 different community based organizations and they've put the word out uh, to community members and they've also then helped folks to sign up for those appointments. I think that once we have a, a steady set of these clinics and our facilities management team is working really hard with us to secure the other couple sites we're looking for in inner northeast as well as uh, Lentz or Rockwood areas. Um, then we can go ahead and um, we'll have schedules set that every single week you can expect that we would be at one of those different sites um, three days a week. And then Portland Fire will also have a fourth and possibly a fifth day a week. And so within the next week or two, I think we'll be able to set those um, vaccine clinic appointments out more broadly. I think that the reason we have um, Focus so far is that there have been so many people so far desperate to get uh, appointments that there are times when there have been clinics, whether they're ours or through another setting that have been set up for a specific community, like let's say developmentally disabled youth and their caretakers, for example, and other folks have distributed widely that vaccine appointment slot through social media. And then we've ended up overwhelmed with a whole lot of folks. And so the, the folks that maybe we had interpreters or we had special other staff there to really serve a unique community has sort of gotten lost in the shuffle. So to that extent, um, we have primarily done that word of mouth um, through community partners. But I think as we have standing sites, we will go ahead and post that a little bit more broadly. Great, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that uh, and that you explained that right now we want more community-based organizations uh, to have access and then hopefully in the next few weeks it will be opened up more broadly. So again, thank you, Kim. You have been amazing. I know that you helped. I, I think you were absent uh, one of the briefings that we got, so I don't know if I personally thanked you for connecting Corinne seniors uh, to a vaccination clinic. Uh, just every time we've asked for something, you've just jumped and responded and uh, just wanted to thank you and your team. Thanks. Do we want to add that to the uh, commissioner segments comments to the last slide where it had the nice things to say? Thank you, Kim, and your team. All right, I'll pass Commissioner Peggy Peterson. Team. Yeah, Commissioner Peggy Peterson. Thank you, Chair. I mean, you can add my thanks too. I think Kim, you and your team are doing such an incredible job and have been for over a year now. Um, and this is this is really impressive. I love looking at that map and seeing where all the different sites are. Um, what, where's the location that was the blue star that was by the um, I-84 and 205 around the gateway area? Uh, we have um, at ERCO, mm, we okay. have our testing site and they have agreed that uh, we can use some of those um, appointments that we have that aren't fully used right now for testing. We don't wanna shrink our testing capacity as Dr. Vines was talking about, even though there's not a lot of demand for testing right now, I don't wanna remove that from the community because as soon as I do, if we have an increase and there's an increased amount of testing, we need to scale it back up. So that's a site. And then the next one in the Rockwood area is at uh, the Latino Network office on the 165th where we have our other testing site where we'll also be integrating in um, vaccine. Um, okay, thank you. That's that's good information. And, I, and um, I'm glad that we're able to like figure out how to use the Full capacity of sites, especially if you know to to um, maximize people getting vaccines or tested as as needed. Um, and I really appreciate um, Commissioner Stegman's comments about like how how would people or question about how people would sign up for these. Um, I know that our community organizations and, and those partners are doing a great job in trying to get the word out to people. But um, you know we know that people and especially um, BIPOC community members are still falling through the cracks. And so I appreciate your help this week and and um, helping somebody who had reached out to me get connected with one of these. But um, I do just want to say just to your comment about, uh, you know, some of these specified clinics getting overwhelmed, like this is really where people need to check their privilege. And like we are having, we're really trying to focus on disparities and how, um, you know, BIPOC and impacted communities are, are really bearing the brunt of COVID in so many ways, either economically or or medically and health. And, and so this is really where we're 
you know, asking people to realize they may be able to access those appointments, but should they be accessing those appointments as especially as we're ramping up all these the the other math sites um, too. I know it's a it's a people everybody wants to be vaccinated, but we really are trying to center those communities. So I would just you know I just want to share that message because it's it's hard, but we also know that um, we have so many communities that have been so devastated by COVID in Multnomah County, and we want to make sure we're serving those. Um, okay, so that was my soapbox. Um, so the other. Um, the other question I have is just on the uh, the slide nine where you had the, the numbers of the different um, vaccines. Those were just the ones that public health was receiving, correct? Do we have an overall, do we have a um, like a number of like how many we're getting in the county overall from all the different um, vaccine, you know, distribution sites? Yeah, the, the only other vaccine coming into the county is into our federally qualified health center and Adrian can give you a sense of how many vaccine doses have come to the FQHC. But do we know just how many are coming into Multnomah County geographically, like on the whole, including our like hospitals oh. and system partners? I understand what you're saying. And interestingly enough, the state has an incredible dashboard and we normally put the two state dashboard pages into this presentation and go over that information with you because there's uh, there's the ability to look at it county specific. And so that's actually a really good first source for the county wide view is the state's dashboard. Right now they have found that they have had some errors in their data and they're revamping all their data. So I think in the next day or two that will be up again and we'll be able to see, uh, they definitely report out a uh, total number of doses uh, by type and by first or second dose. I don't have the number for you right now because they had some confusion where some doses um, were attributed to us, we're from other counties, and some of the vaccine that had come to us and been given in our county actually seemed to not be showing up. So they're doing some data cleaning right now. Okay, it sounds like they need to be doing that. So th thanks for just letting us know about that. I just, and really my, you know, it's just to see the trend, right? Like we know that there are other states who are getting higher per capita, you know, allotments of vaccines than we are in Oregon. And so really just, you know, I think it's good information to see what's the trend of the vaccines that we're getting because I think we are doing a good job of trying to get those out into the community as fast as possible in all of these different ways. So, um, so just you know, just having that data is always helpful. But anyway, just want to like reiterate my thanks to everything that you're doing here and um, and what we're doing to to get people vaccinated here as quickly as possible. Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kim. It's good to see you. Um, and I, I did have a few questions and uh, recognize um, our, you know, the hour, but uh, I want to raise them and potentially they can be responded to offline if, if the answer is a little more complex. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, this is just a comment for how how I take in information and I think I, you know, I'm having difficulty sort of getting getting that sort of bigger picture of the flow of how we was receive what we receive as a county, how that flows through and goes to our 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 different um, community based partners, how things how things are distributed and then the FQHCs, public health clinics. Um, you know, the, the, the different charts BIPOC focus versus not. Um, and I was just wondering if there's a way to, to have that mapped out as a flow, um, so for maybe to, to put that all together in a picture. And I know you don't have time to be doing art, you're doing other things, but, um, but that it would just be helpful to have even a basic flow chart to understand what's flowing where. Um, and we can we can talk more about that. Um, sure. So it it changes every month. I will say that the first yeah. month we, we gave a lot of vaccine to occupational health to vaccinate county and subcontractor employees who are in phase one A, and then yeah. we gave vaccine to um, AMR, which is our paramedic team. They had a, a um, contract with the state to vaccinate long term care facilities. So. We gave vaccine to a lot of pharmacies and AMR to bring to those residential facilities. And then more recently, we've given vaccine to some of our safety net clinics and community health clinics until the state could take that over. So there's been like three waves of types of folks that we've 
taken some of our allocation and distributed it out to. But I'm happy yeah. to, to share more detail about that in whatever way you want it visually represented. You Thank that. you. And maybe that, I mean, I, I think that might be some of the problem that there is so much from the state level, so much arbitrariness and no, you know, and it just, it, it is so changing. Um, it's hard to get a grasp of it. Um, so, um, thank you. I, I also, I wanted to just mention, you know, I, I found it a pretty stark, um, to recognize that, uh, there is not a, a single site for a clinic of any kind on the west side of Multnomah County. And um, I know there's a lot that, you know, clearly we need to be focusing on uh, the larger uh, populations who are vulnerable or who, who meet various criteria, but we have pockets of extreme poverty on the west side. We have huge challenges, um, a lot of vulnerable people, um, significant um you know uh out by salvi island we have a huge uh um immigrant farm worker population we have a couple of areas neighborhoods that have uh very large somali populations and to have actually not a single site on the west side was just really um was really stark when i saw that on the map so i um, would love to talk to you about a way that we can maybe engage uh, at least one place on the west side so that we can have somewhere for these folks to go. Um, that would be great. And, um, and, uh, and then just in terms of, uh, how, I'm, I'm curious how public health clinics or the public health sites and centers are integrating and coordinating with the um, FQHCs, because I've heard from some um, clinic FQHC providers that they they have capacity and that the, a lot of people would be their, their people and they, they're not sure how to be able to administer more vaccine. Like they, I think there's some confusion between the people by the people on the front line who feel they could be doing more and it's not clear where the engagement and coordination exists sort of at that higher level to make that happen i guess so, i'd say engagement and coordinate coordination is happening through uh health share and care oregon our ccos convening different fqhcs as well as the coalition of community health centers has been a convener so I've definitely been in a number of meetings where we've all collectively worked together on strategies. Uh, Rosewood stood up a, a couple of large clinics for the Asian community with the Asian Health and Services Center, and we just helped back them up by getting them some extra clinical volunteers and offered them a vaccine, but they had enough. Uh, I do know that there's a couple small teams of folks that have said, hey, we've got the capacity if you want us to send some clinical folks your way uh, we could take on like a community based vaccination site. Others like Virginia Garcia and some of the other clinics um, have had the capacity to go ahead and vaccinate community members who aren't their patient population. And I'm sure Adrian will speak to the, the level of effort that we have to vaccinate our huge patient population is, is top priority for um, our own FQHC right now. So if you do know about uh, smaller safety net clinics or FQHCs, who have more capacity and are not sure how to be able to share that with the community, I'd love to hear about it and I definitely can hook them up. Okay. And I actually was talking about our own FQHCs, our own clinics with our ICS. So okay. it's actually our own people who are saying this. Um, so that's uh, that's where that had come from. But But also groups like the Asian Health and Services Center have said they could do so much more. They just need the vaccines and I went to their site um, uh, last week or the week before, and it's phenomenal what they are able to accomplish. And the the other area that I um, would just be interested again in following up with you, but the how we are optimizing our medical reserve core because there are so many um, populations and opportunities who are most vulnerable and who we could get to that um, you know that that there are so many volunteers out there ready to do this and 
And um, it's great that we have AMR or the fire department or whomever, but but we have people just raring to go that um, I, I'm just curious how we're planning on expanding or optimizing our volunteer base of medical providers who can administer vaccines. But we can we can talk about that. Oh, okay. I, I can just I can give a super brief response. Um, so part of it has been the challenge of vaccine supply, Commissioner Myron. So um, yes, we have amazing volunteers ready to go. Uh, we're just we're waiting for more vaccine. Um, we are also getting in place an MRC coordinator. So it is it is really a job, as as you know, to make sure uh, they're trained and oriented and settled on dates and, and have a good experience because uh, we we want them to. Uh, and then finally, uh, with the state's advisory around uh, various professionals who are now uh, eligible to be vaccinators, one example is veterinarians. Um, we have a whole new pool uh, for potential recruitment. Um, so I think we're we're ready. We're just we're waiting for the vaccine supply to come online in order to be able to to adequately match vaccines with vaccinators and medical volunteers and people wanting to be vaccinated. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Um, really appreciate it. No further questions. Awesome. Well, I think we have Adrian ready and waiting to take over if I am not mistaken. Good morning. Um, thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Commissioners, for uh, letting me join the public health presentation this morning. For the record, my name is Adrienne Daniels and I'm the Deputy Director of Integrated Clinical Services, which is also known as the Community Health Center Program. Um, just wanted to start with a very brief overview of the role of uh, the Community Health Center Program. Uh, our, our work in the county is to be in partnership with public health to provide the full comprehensive primary care, dental, pharmacy services to the safety net population. It's, it's really rooted in assuring that any person can access care and we work hand in hand with public health on identifying not just what are the clinical services needed, but how do we identify the right populations? The, who are the groups that are having trouble accessing care and really have been disproportionately impacted by um, both environmental um, issues, social issues, um, other large barriers to care, um, not just specific clinical needs. Our population um, is incredibly diverse. Approximately 60% 60, 60 of our patients self-identify as a person of color, and nearly 40% um, are served in language um, other than English, with more than 100 different languages um, identified from the past year. We also have a, a very, um, very diverse financial um, sort of span of resources among our patients. The majority of them, um, as a family, make less than $24,000 a year for Oregon, which is considered 200% of the federal poverty guideline. It's not even base poverty. Um, in addition, we also see a significant portion of our population who reports experiencing homelessness at some part of the year. Next slide, please. I, as a federally qualified health center, we have also been fortunate to be recognized at the federal level as well as the state level. Um, we're excited to announce that we are significantly ramping up our vaccination efforts over this next month. Uh, President Biden has a specific plan to recognize the role of health centers across the country, including ours. We were part of a pilot program of 250 health centers that are being given access to direct order systems to distribute and administer the COVID-19 vaccine. At the state level, um, we're all, we've also been recognized by the state for our ability to reach specific safety net populations, including those who have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 um, because of our ability to serve high numbers of racial and ethnic minorities in the state. The Oregon Health Authority has given us um, the approval to vaccinate any of our patients separate from the state's um, timeline of different priority populations um, because we serve a very specific safety net group. Next slide, please. As I mentioned before, we are part of a unique federal pilot, which is to help expand access to safety net populations. Each week, we are able to order a limited amount of vaccine 
And unfortunately, that amount is variable. So on a week to week basis, we could order potentially up to 1000 vaccines or as little as 100 vaccines, depending on what the federal supply looks like. In the past week, it has been about 500 vaccines a week um, with some additional availability from Johnson and Johnson. We currently have been able to support 3 main sites each week um, and then depending on the availability of vaccine offer additional pop up ones um, to our community as well. Next slide. Please. Starting towards the end of this month, we are really ramping up our operations and bringing in staff to offer vaccine clinics five days a week. So instead of a three day a week model, we are really moving to every single day of the week. How do we get vaccines offered to our patients? Um, we continue to offer an interest form on our website for patients to indicate, yes, please call me. I want to get a vaccine appointment. We are also setting up a self scheduling tool for patients um, and we continue to maintain a personal outreach approach where we have um, staff members calling patients on the phone individually, asking them if they're interested in the vaccine, explaining what their options are and letting them know that we're here for questions. Next slide please. With our uh, efforts in making sure that we are really reaching our patients in a way that's equitable, we want to make sure that we are looking from uh, at this as a lens of who's been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And so every um, week we sit down and take a look at who has been able to access the vaccine from our FQHC system. Um, and is that number going to potentially change week to week based off of the number of vaccines available? So over the next three slides, I just want to share a little bit of data about um, who we've specifically been able to reach. This first slide here talks about race and ethnicity. Um, we have seen from our own FQHC population numbers, the uh, patients who are disproportionately having higher rates of COVID um, come from the Hispanic and um, American Indian, Alaska Native, uh, and Asian American um, communities. And so we specifically set ourselves the goal of making sure we're do we are doing outreach and engagement with those specific patient groups. From our um, vaccine percentages, we can see that we have um, been able to reach a disproportionate number of racial and ethnic minorities. Approximately 70% of our patients each week at vaccine clinics come from these groups, um, with Hispanic patients being the majority at 36%. Next slide, please. We're also taking a look by financial class. Um, one of the, the hallmarks of federally qualified health centers and community health centers is that they really are there to serve the safety net community. Um, so focusing on folks who do not have insurance, have insurance that doesn't cover all services or primarily are served by Medicaid. These numbers here look a little different than what we would typically expect, specifically because our outreach was initially focused on patients who come from age 65 and up. And so what you'll see here is you'll see a reflection of uh, a higher number of Medicare patients than we would typically see proportionally for our entire population because of that age difference. But we also want to pay attention to the number of self pay patients. You'll see that sitting at about 27%. That's higher than our typical patient population where we usually have about 20% uninsured patients over a year. And what this tells us is that we are doing a good job of actually reaching and connecting with patients that do not have insurance as well as with patients who do come into those older age categories. Next slide, please. Finally, taking a look at language as a potential barrier to access and care. Um, I mentioned before that we are one of the most linguistically diverse FQHCs in the country. Um, we continue to see a high proportion of patients who require or request interpretation services for their vaccine appointments. Approximately 48% of our patients have uh, needed an interpreter for their vaccine appointment. Um, the breakdown for the Highest number of um, language requests to seen here. Uh, predominantly, we see Spanish and Cantonese as our top language request, followed by Vietnamese, Arabic, and Somali as well. We do have interpreters on site for our larger vaccine events, specifically for those languages where we know there are going to be a high number of patients who are requesting interpretation services. We also continue to provide our typical over the phone, iPad, and in person services um, for interpretation. I believe this is my final slide, um, and I know we are close to it over time, but I'm happy to also take questions. Wonderful, that would be great, Adrian. Thank you for that. Um, 
exciting news and a lot of work ahead. Commissioner Myron, questions for Adrian? Uh, no questions. Thank you, Adrian. Commissioner Becky Peterson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian, for this presentation. Um, I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say I was, I mean, it's so great that we got to be part of Project Backs and our and we were um highlighted for that. And I think that was gave us such a jump start in being able to reach out to our most vulnerable communities and getting the vaccinations done. So thank you for sharing all the information with us. Thank you, Chair. Uh, no questions other than just to express my gratitude. This is really exciting how we have prioritized our BIPOC populations and our current uh, clients to make sure. Uh, I know even as somebody who has access to technology and, and information uh, that it is challenging uh, to access vaccines either for your loved ones or for yourself. And the fact that, that we have this intense program to help those that don't have um, access as easily as others is really remarkable. And I just want to thank you uh, for making sure uh, that all of those folks have better access. Thanks everyone for this very informational briefing this morning. Thank you to commissioners for staying a little bit later um, to hear all of this information. Um, as always, if you have follow-up questions, you can reach out um, to Nicole Buchanan in my office and she will help get you connected to any other questions you may have because there was a lot of information this morning. Um, really appreciate all the work that's going on with our team. And that is all we have on the agenda for today. Um, but we will be back Thursday morning at 930 for our regularly scheduled board meeting. So I will see you all then, if not before. Take care, stay safe.